Okay, so this morning we're going to be reading from Numbers chapter 20, verse 22, and then jumping into chapter 21. The whole Israelite community set out from Kadesh and came to Mount Hor. They travelled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. The Israelites then moved on and camped at Oboth. Thank you, Penny. If I could have the old PowerPoint, that would be great. Well, this is weird, isn't it? This is weird. I've uh, arrived at this place uh, in the middle of a field somewhere. Not quite sure uh, where I am. Maybe the sat-nav took me to Mendelsham or something. But anyway, I've arrived at this place in the middle of a field, and I think they're Christians. Uh, I don't think they're Jehovah's Witnesses or, or Mormons. It's not the C of E, but it's church, and people are nice. I've got a nice welcome on the way in. There's a bit of coffee and stuff, and there's this guy up the front, and there's a little worksheet for the kids, and people are nice enough, but it's a bit weird. Uh, it's just a bit strange. There's a very small swimming pool uh, at the front, Uh, And in a moment, someone's going to get dunked uh, in there. Uh, That Bible passage was weird in all sorts of ways. Uh, Very strange. What is going on? Who are these people? Where even is this? When is this? And and what are all these snakes? And I just don't understand what's going on. And it's about to get even weirder because in a moment, the guy at the front is going to take his trousers off and... (laughs) <laughs> don't worry, <laughs> we've got a changing room, so that's fine. But it's just weird, isn't it? And you know, well, some Christians are weird. Uh, it, <laughs> it takes all sorts to make a world, and some Christians are weird. But in a sense, all Christians are weird. We're strange, because we claim to be temporary residents in this world. We believe that really this world is not our home. There's some great things that we love about this world. We're going to have a barbecue in a minute, as you'll see. There's bouncy castles. There's some things that we love about living in this world. And yet, at the same time as a Christian, this isn't our home. We feel, as one person has said, homesick at home. This isn't where we belong. And so that can make Christians uh, a little bit weird. Uh, But on top of that, actually, what I want to say uh, briefly this morning is that actually we're all weird, or at least most of us in this room uh, today. Uh, Harvard professor Joseph uh, Henrik has described the West, people in the West, uh, us people, I guess, most of us here today, as being the weirdest people in the world. Actually, we're the weirdest people in the world. He says that we're psychologically peculiar and particularly prosperous. We're Western We're educated, we're industrialised, we're rich, and we're democratic. We're all a little bit weird. Uh, That said, it is weird, isn't it? This Bible passage is weird. Baptism is a bit weird as well. I was telling someone what I was doing on the weekend, and they said, oh, what are you doing? On, and I was trying to explain what it is, and it just seems a bit weird, doesn't it? So let's think about those two things. First, this Bible passage, and then we'll, we'll come to Grace's baptism a bit later, and just try and understand uh, these things a little bit. As a, a church, we've been engaging recently with all sorts of people, uh, different backgrounds, uh, agnostics, and Atheists of all different shapes and sizes and flavours and people with different ideas, people uh, investigating the claims of Christianity. And one of the things that we found as we've talked with people is uh, there are a number of uh, folks that we've come into contact with and certainly 
uh, in our culture, who, who for them, what they've begun to realise is that for them they feel that there's wisdom here in this book, in the Bible. There's a, there's a wisdom here that's been suppressed in our culture. You know, you're not really meant to sort of talk about the Bible too much, make too much of a fuss about it. You're all right, you keep it to your own home, but uh, certainly don't bring the Bible into public life and your workplace and, and so on. That's kind of been sort of, it's, it's off the table, isn't it, the Bible? But folks are going, no, actually, I think there's something in this. There's some wisdom uh, here. We saw it, didn't we, at the coronation, whether you go back to... Uh, the, the, the late Queen Elizabeth's or, or, or King Charles, uh, the coronation as they were presented with the Bible, just one of the things that was said to them is, here is wisdom. Here is wisdom. And so people uh, have begun to discover this, that there's actually a wisdom uh, to what the Bible says. C.S. Lewis uh, was, uh, of course, the author of, of Narnia, and uh, some of you kids might have watched the films or, or read the books. Uh, he wrote on many other things besides. C.S. Lewis moved from a position of being an atheist uh, to being a theist through to being a Christian believer. And one of his little insights, which is helpful for all of us, is he said that all cultures have their blind spots. Every culture has got its blind spots, including our own. And what we need, as he put it, is the breeze of the centuries, the old stuff, the breeze of the centuries blowing through our modern minds. In other words, including things like what we find uh, in the Bible. Uh, when I was a, a student at a university, I went to the University of of Nottingham it's not all as impressive as that but you know that's the one that they show you on the brochure sort of thing but I went to University of Nottingham about 30,000 students big university and about a third of those students were international students and of them about 10,000 people quite a number of them were Chinese students now when a Chinese student came to uni one of the first things that they wanted to do is get hold of this book and read it, and ask their questions, and talk to Christians, and find out more about the context of this uh, content of this book, because back home in China, with communism and everything that's happened there, this had been suppressed. So it was like a bit cheeky and a bit naughty to open the Bible and find out what it says. Now, for the next 10 minutes or so, what I'd like us to do, if you can possibly come with me on this, is to be Chinese. Can we do that? I want us to be Chinese just for the next 10 minutes and open up the Bible and be really naughty and take a look at what the Bible uh, has to say. Uh, now, there are um, uh, many people in our uh, culture today who uh, are realising, uh, or believing, thinking, feeling that perhaps there is something else there's maybe something more you know there's more to life there's something else that, that there's something out there and they're sensible in in coming to that conclusion because they follow the clues don't they uh, they look at the world around them as you drove perhaps in the car over here this morning you look out the window and you see all sorts of things and they look at the world around them and they see small things and big things and they look at them and as they see those things they see evidence of design uh, and they wonder from that well perhaps there was a designer they see patterns in the physical world and they think well maybe someone set up those patterns laws of nature well maybe there's a lawgiver uh, they look around our world and they see uh, all of the the color and the beauty and the grandeur of our incredibly creative world and they come to the radical conclusion well, there might just well be a creative creator who made it all. Now, on top of that, people look at the world and we know things through modern science, don't we? We see uh, perhaps things that you can't always see, things that are sometimes unseen or under certain circumstances you can see them, uh, and other things besides that you can't see at all, things like gravity and things like consciousness and the, the, the human capacity to form ideas, information. Right now, I am uh, producing information. It's coming out of my mouth, I guess, and you're processing information all the time, but it's totally unseen. We can't see that, but it's very real. And there are many other things like that in life, aren't there? Love. Love is very real, 
but it's unseen. Courage is so real and so amazing, (laughs) but it's unseen. And people reason from those things and think, well, perhaps there is an unseen God. They have a hunch based on a ton of clues that maybe there is a maker. Now, the Christian faith pushes further than that, of course, doesn't it? The Christian faith says that there is a God who made all things and that he has revealed himself to us. Yeah, through clues like that, but also in time and space through his son, Jesus, who is a real historical person who lived 2,000 years ago. If you'd lived in the right place at the right time, you could have met the man and many people did and wrote about it. But God has revealed himself to us through his son who lived and died and we believe rose again. Now it turns out that's rather helpful when it comes to working out how to live. It's a big question in life, isn't it? How, how to live? How do I live? What do I do? What's the kind of, how am I going to operate? How am I going to live? And it's complicated, isn't it? Because I've got my view and, and you've got your view and you've got an opinion or a, a preference perhaps and we've all got different tendencies and preferences and desires and, and plans and it's all very subjective, isn't it? How do I live? Well, you've got an idea and I've got an idea. How do we work out how to live? It's incredibly subjective. There might be a, a minority view or a majority view but what's really helpful is when someone from the outside speaks into our world and into our lives and shows us how our world and how our lives work best. And that's the claim of Christianity, isn't it? God has spoken from the outside into our world and he shows us how the world works best and how our lives work best. And it's a bonus ball, isn't it? Because he made it all right, so he knows how it works best. And that's good. But then the trouble comes, doesn't it? (laughs) Thereby is the problem, isn't it? Because that also means that there is a standard set by our maker and I've persistently missed the mark. God knows how life works best in this world. He's set a standard. He's set a framework. He knows what's best and good for me. And I have persistently missed the mark we've persistently missed the mark we've not lived up to the standards of our loving creator and as you examine your life you realize as I do that actually we've not even lived up to our own standards never mind the ones uh, that he has set which are good for us we know we've messed up don't we we all have foibles we all make faux pas we know that but there are also in our lives faults and failings and fouls, and flaws, and we fall out, and we fight, and we fall short of the standard that he has given. As someone called Alan Jacobs, a a fantastic author and literary critic, says this, any moderately perceptive and reasonably honest observer of humanity has to acknowledge that we are remarkably prone to doing bad things, and more disturbingly, things we acknowledge to be wrong. Isn't that crazy? We do things that we we know that's wrong, but we do it anyway. He sums up and says, the picture is anything but pretty. And you know what? All of that, I know that's a long journey, but all of that puts us here. It puts us right here in Numbers chapter 21, because that's where the people are here, aren't they? Uh, They're getting a bit ratty, actually. Maybe it was hot like this. I guess it probably was. And they're just getting a bit hot and bothered and a bit ratty. And as it happens in this particular episode, they're getting a bit ratty with God, Uh, a bit impatient with him, aren't they? Verse 4, the people grew impatient on the way. Uh, But it wasn't just that. I don't know if you've ever felt impatience towards God or or anyone else. Probably at some point this morning you've experienced a bit of impatience, maybe getting children out of the door or whatever it might be. But they go beyond impatience, don't they? Verse 5, they spoke against God and against Moses. So they spoke against God's appointed leader and they spoke against God himself. Ever done that? Ever spoken against God? I have. Guilty as charged. They spoke against God and, well, they say, don't we, what do do they say to God? They say, verse 5, why? They're talking to God. They say, why? Have you ever been there? You know, why, God? 
Why is this happening like this? I guess all of us at some point have felt that, at least felt it. Why, God? But they move beyond the kind of why, what on earth is going on, God, to why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. They're not happy, are they? They detest what God has given, and so they deny that he is good, and they defame his name, and we've done the same. Uh, You know the story so far with these people, it's a wonderful story. They've been rescued out of slavery in Egypt, and God has rescued them, and he's fed and watered them, and he's guided them and looked after them like a parent, brought them through the wilderness, and their net response to God has been ingratitude and contempt. And that's us too. Uh, We get impatient with each other, we speak against each other and so on, but we also do that against God as well. We treat God with ingratitude uh, and contempt. We live in his world, but we choose to live our way. And you know, just like how it operates in our lives today, the punishment has to fit the crime. We've committed crimes against God, and there is a punishment for that. The Bible says that the penalty for these things is death. That there's a universal problem and that requires a universal penalty. Now that's hard to hear, isn't it? It's incredibly hard to hear. But don't we all long for that, really? Don't we long for justice at the end at some point? You look around the world and you see atrocities and awful things happening and you cry out for justice, don't you? The problem is that we're all included. (laughs) that actually uh, we're all part of this universal problem and so we all face the universal penalty, which is death. And in this particular situation, God sends snakes, doesn't he? Did you see that in the passage as Penny read it? God sends snakes among them. And it's all going wrong, isn't it? People are dying, they're being bitten and they die. God has sent snakes among them and they say in verse 7, we sinned. That's really the conclusion of everything we've just been talking about, isn't it? We've sinned. It's the Christian language, it's the Bible language, but it's all of that impatience towards God, it's all of that speaking against God, it's all of the other things that we've described. We've sinned. Uh, Kids, we've been learning about this in Kids Club, haven't we? What is sin? Uh, Can any of the kids do it with me? Some of you, I bet you can, can't you? Sin is when we say, what do we say? We say, shove off God, I'm in charge, no to your rules. That's right, isn't it? Thank you. Yeah, that's sin. Uh, And so uh, they're crying out, uh, they don't know what to do. They say, we've sinned against God. And they turn to Moses and they say, please pray for us, Moses. Will you you pray to God for us, please, Moses? Now, uh, we know, don't we, that at this point, as Moses prays to God to take the snakes away, God's got three options, right? What are his three options? Well, he could say, couldn't he, yes. Uh, Now, parents, you understand this, right? God's sort of parenting his people through the wilderness. As parents, you'll understand these three options. God's got three options, hasn't he? He could say yes. He could say no. Or or perhaps, more likely, he could say, what do we all say? Not now, maybe later, right? Or something like that, don't we? Not now, maybe later, or in a minute, right? Those are God's three options. He can say yes, take the snakes away. He can say no, leave them there. Or he can say not now, maybe later, yeah? Those are his options. What does God do? Well, he turns to Moses in verse 8, doesn't he? And he says to Moses, make a snake. Make a snake. You can imagine, Moses is like, no! (laughs) No, God, the the snakes are the problem, right? Do you know, you know, the, the snakes are the problem. There are snakes everywhere and they're biting people. We've given you three options. You can say yes, take them away or no, and leave them there or not now, maybe later, but please do something. The snakes are the problem. Don't give us another snake, God. What are you thinking, Lord? You imagine how Moses felt and the people felt, oh, make a snake. But of course, in this particular situation, it's not a normal snake, is it? It's a snake of bronze or, or copper. And it's placed on a stick and Moses lifts it up. And it's very simple, isn't it? God says, look, anyone who's bitten can look at it and live. Anyone who's bitten can look at it uh, and live. 
You can imagine Moses is like, oh, this is great. Actually, no, sorry, God. Yeah, got that a bit wrong. This is really good, isn't it? Everyone's getting bitten by snakes. That's the big problem. But all you've got to do is look at the snake and live. And you can imagine Moses going up to people and saying, look, all you've got to do is just there. Can you see it? You just look at it and, and you'll live. You can imagine him going around and some of them were maybe like, no, Moses, we need to call the poison line. We need to call the poison centre. What's the number? I don't know. Or, or maybe we've got a, a potion or a poultice to sort this out. Or, or maybe, you know, maybe we should try a and &E. I know it's busy, but it might be worth a shot. But, but uh, Moses is like, no, no, no. You don't need to pick up the phone. You don't need to phone a friend. You don't need to do anything. You don't even need to get near this thing. All you've got to do, you're down here. You've been bit by a snake. All you've got to do is look and live and he's trying to tell them you know just look at the snake and you'll live God has set this up look and live it's weird isn't it let's acknowledge that it's weird snake up there people get busy. it's weird but it's simple it's really simple you don't even need to move from where you are just look and live and you know thousands of years later Jesus uh, talks about this he says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man, that's Jesus, must be lifted up. He's talking about his death on the cross. Jesus is likening it to that situation. And he's saying, look, just like they lifted up the bronze servant in the wilderness, I'm going to be lifted up on the cross. And all you've got to do is look and live. He explains it more. He, he helps us to understand it. He says that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. All you've got to do is look to Jesus, dying on the cross for you, believe and trust in him, and you can have life. And that's what grace has done. It, it's weird, <laughs> but it's very simple, isn't it? She has looked to Jesus, and so she lives. And that's what her baptism is all about celebrating that, marking that, uh, symbolizing that in a way, that she has looked to Jesus uh, and now she lives. But it's not just for Grace Heart, is it? It's not just for Rich Turl, it's not just for that Christian that invited you here or whoever it might be in the room or elsewhere. No, it's actually for everyone because you know the very next verse, the very next breath of Jesus is the most famous verse in the whole Bible, isn't it? John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus says, look to me and live. And did you notice what he says? Whoever believes, whoever believes, Christianity is radically inclusive, isn't it? Whoever believes. It's not like just for these people over here. It's not like, well, what you've got to do is come to church a bit and sort of clean up your act and get sorted out. No, it's whoever believes. Whoever you are, wherever you are, wherever you've been, whatever you've got up to, whatever you've done in life, whatever your life's looked like, we're all different. Whoever you are, you can come and believe and trust in Jesus. That's what it means to look. And you can live, says Jesus. A uh, man walks into a chapel. I know that sounds like a really bad Suffolk Baptist joke. Um, but a man walks into a chapel. This is a real story, true story. It's a many, many years ago, a man walks into uh, a chapel. He was a young man. And he, and he comes in and he sits down. And uh, he's expecting just the regular, usual stuff, the normal speaker. Uh, but unfortunately, the normal, whoever it was, guy who would normally be there, he can't be there, he's unwell or he's being held up or something, he's not there. So uh, this geezer gets up, who's not perhaps the, the strongest uh, up the front, but he kind of gets up and he thinks, well, he'll, you know, say something. And basically, he's got about 10 minutes worth of stuff. And then he starts to run out. But the Bible passage that he's sort of talking about is an Old Testament passage where uh, God says, uh, look to me. It's all it is, very simple message, look to me. And, and so the guy sort of starts talking to the people in front of him and applying it. And he says, look, all you've got to do is, is look to him. All you've got to do is, is look at him. Look to me, God says. Now he says to them, he starts applying things. He says, look, you need not have gone to college to look. He says, uh, you could be a big old fool and you can look. He says, you could be a child and you can look. 
uh, it doesn't matter who you are, it's pretty simple, isn't it? You can look, we can all look. He says you just need to look to Jesus. Don't look to yourselves, look to him. So he's talking to everybody. And then he turns to the young man who's come expecting someone different, but he's, he's going to get something very different. But this guy turns directly to the man and he says, young man, you look very miserable today. <laughs> Interesting approach, but there you go. You look very miserable today. And he says, you know what? You will always be miserable in life and in death unless you obey my text. Look. Look to him, he says. And you know, at that moment, the young man got it. He realized that Christianity is not about what you do, but about what God has done for you. He just got it. It's called grace. It's the way that God has treated us through his son Jesus as he sorts out our sin as he makes a way for us to be forgiven. And he got it. He said, the darkness rolled away, the clouds were gone, and at that moment I saw the Son, Jesus. Now Jesus was lifted up for you on the cross. He was lifted up there for you. And he died and took the penalty that we all deserve. We all experience the universal human problem of sin. We all live that. We all face the universal penalty. But Jesus died on the cross so that you can look at him with the eye of faith and in his death, you can have life. And he did that for you. The death of Jesus on the cross is a historical fact, isn't it? All I'm adding to that is saying that, look, in his death is life. In his death is life. So you can look to him today and have life. Now thousands of people have, millions of people has, have grace has, I have, many people in this room today have too. But what about you? Will you look to Jesus? Will you look to him and find life in him? You've really got nothing to lose and absolutely everything to gain. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I do thank you for Jesus. I thank you that he lived on this earth, that he died on the cross. Father, that he died for me. And Father, I pray that each one of us would come to know Jesus personally and to have life in him. For we ask in his name. Amen.